I must admit it is my first visit uh, here in Riga, so it is very interesting for me to be here, to see your university and to have discussions with colleagues from this university in order to build networks in terms of research and, and teaching and all these kind of cooperation in an academic sense. Kapuczynski, the reporter, he liked questions. I have been reading his books and I recommend you to read his books too because he's a really, he's a great person. He's very authentic and he loves people and he loves regions and he loves culture and he always loves to ask questions. He very often says, says in this, his books that very often it is much more important to define the right questions than to have very rapid answers. Our global economy and the global economic governance system might look very different after the economic crisis that we are going through. And I will show you four different futures that might emerge. The first one is the most positive one. Cooperation and a balanced multilateral system might emerge. This is the most positive perspective. But the second one is the green one here, re-engineered Western centrism. The perspective here would be that the OECD countries, the industrialized countries, might try to stabilize their privileges in the world, trying to keep the other actors out of the game. The third one is then fragmented protectionism. There is still fear in the international arena that protectionism might appear as a result of the economic crisis. And the fourth one here is regionalism. If we would not be able to organize a rebalanced multilateral system, regions might become stronger. So these are four very different options that we do have on the, on the tables now when we discuss in the international arenas the consequences of the international financial crisis. And the impacts on developing countries would be huge. The context might be very different. The point that I would like to make is that the situation is not stable. There are very different avenues in front of us. Why is Europe's role in development cooperation relevant? 60% of the international ODA, these are the Overseas Development Assistant Aid investments, are European, 60%. So the majority of the international investments in development cooperation are coming from European member states or the European Union as a transnational organization. 60%. And I would like to see this 60% translating into political capital. My perception is that we do invest a lot of money in this policy era, but on the global scale we are not always the most important actors. We do not have the influence that we might have if we would work together closely. We do have, in reality, behind the 60% of international ODA, which is European, 27 member states and the European Commission. So we are 28 actors. And we are investing 60% of the global ODA funds, but uh, fragmented. I would then like to separate two different concept of the concepts of development policy that we are also discussing at the European level currently. The first one is a more narrow fo focus on development policy. It is focused on the MDG agenda, on the MDGs, on the poverty reduction agenda, and it is focused on the poorest people in the poorest countries. Maybe some of you have been reading a very famous book or the, a book that has become very famous during the last two years or so from Paul Collier. It's called The Bottom Bullion. And he's arguing in favor of a development policy with very good arguments that we need to focus our development cooperation on the bottom bullion, the most, the poorest people, extreme poverty, wherever they are, let's focus on that. From my perspective, and this is then the, the second concept of development policy, this is only a part of the development policy agenda. Because if we understand development policy as the, corpor the, corp the cooperation between industrialized countries and developing countries, emerging countries, if we define development policy in this context, the poverty agenda is part of it, but there are other elements that we need to bring in. The first one is about the poverty agenda. 
investing in the social development and economic development in developing countries. This is the MDG agenda to say so. But the second one is to tackle world problems together where we need to cooperate because if we don't cooperate with developing countries, we cannot, cannot even solve the problem. So this would be a second element. Then strengthen the global governance capacities of developing countries. I have been spoken about that. And influence from a policy development policy perspective relevant international regimes that are important for developing countries. The WTO, the Kyoto process, this is climate policy, international financial order. So development policy trying to shape the other arenas that are relevant for developing countries. In the European Union, this is one of the challenges. How development policy and the commissioner can try to influence our trade policy because we see that from time to time our European trade policy is counterproductive from a development policy perspective. So shaping from a development policy perspective other international policies would then be part of the development policy agenda. We do have the money to solve the problem. We do have the money to build a low carbon economy and to fight poverty. Because to do that, we need around 1.5% of our global GDP to do so. We can't do that. This would not imply to create a financial crisis or something like that. 1.5% of the global GDP, this is manageable. The second good news was then, um, the technologies are there. We are not confronted with a problem that we cannot change. We can shape the problem and solve the problem because the technologies, the low carbon technologies, are already there. We need to invest in those. And then the two big challenges globally. The first big challenge is the time scale. We have been seeing that the peak that we need to reach regarding the greenhouse gases globally is between 2015 in five years to 2020 at the latest. So the time framework to manage the problem is really a huge challenge. We need to act really quick. We do not have decades to move forward. It's a time of acting rapidly. This is the first major challenge, time, the time schedule. And the fourth uh, schedule has to do then with this, uh, with this photo. And this is about international cooperation. And this is about responsibility and solidarity because what we can argue is that with all our data that we bring together is that the for, for fighting dangerous climate change, we need to bring not only the industrialized countries onto low carbon growth patterns, we need to bring also all developing countries on low carbon growth patterns. If not, it will not work. But to do so, we will really need a global approach and a global effort solidarity and responsibility to push this forward. We cannot solve this problem alone, not within G8 or the European Union or the transatlantic system. We need to bring all the developing countries in too. If not, we will fail. I'm coming to the beginning again, finishing. <laughs> this is also what Europe is about. What we need in Europe to be able to cooperate is a we identity. If we do not understand ourselves in Europe as Europeans, our cooperation will not work. Why should some countries invest in the development of other countries? This is about we identities. So to cooperate, you need we identities. And in Europe, we are on the way to build those. It's not always very easy, but we try to do so.